All right, well, good morning, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be standing here uh, outside the Age Care Seton Retirement Home in South Calgary with uh, Health Minister Tyler Shandro, with Salima Walji Shibji, who is Vice President of Client and Community Engagement for Age Care, uh, and uh, board, t board Chair for Alberta Continuing Care Association, with whom we've been working very closely on helping to protect seniors through the pandemic. We also have uh, Leah LeKelt, who is Executive Director for the Christian Health Association of Alberta, and they operate uh, many uh, nursing homes across the province and, and have a wonderful history, a tradition, going back over a century of caring for the vulnerable in Alberta. We also have our uh, local uh, MLA, Matt Jones, MLA for Calgary Southeast, and I want to thank him for uh, his presence, but also his strong voice, particularly for children and their well-being in this pandemic. And of course, a huge thank you to aged care owners, Dr. Uh, Hasmuk Patel and Dr. Jabir Jivraj for hosting us today, uh, and all of the residents of the uh, aged uh, age care, who are many of whom are watching in their, in their windows, I believe. In Budget 2021, Alberta's government made an historic investment in protecting lives and the livelihoods of Albertans. And this includes a, an historic $23 billion investment in health care, the highest budget for health care by far in the history of Alberta. Uh, that uh, is partly due to a $900 million uh, increase uh, in the overall health care budget, as well as one point. Uh, Two five billion in contingency funding, continue to, to continue the fight against COVID nineteen, and this is in addition to two billion dollars that we already spent uh, in the last year on responding to the pandemic through our healthcare system, and some of that funding has gone to support continuing care facilities like the one right here in Seton. This is important. This important funding has helped these centers to care for their residents either through op operational funds for things like personal protective equipment uh, and enhanced cleaning, as well as enhanced cleaning and staffing and other COVID related costs. But the funding has also provided wage uh, top ups for healthcare aides who are critically important to residents. We may recall about a year ago when the pandemic started that in some parts of, of Canada, in, in, in the central Canadian provinces, there was a, a, a critical shortage of uh, healthcare aides to the point where in Quebec, they had to bring in uh, hundreds of army personnel to staff uh, the long-term care facilities. Thank goodness we were much better prepared for that here in Alberta and our wage top-ups were partly to stabilize the workforce uh, and also address the, the need to, to keep workers as much as possible attached to one particular facility. Uh, that too was, was made possible through our, our critical funding. Now I know this funding doesn't take away the pain uh, for hundreds of families who have experienced the terrible loss of a loved one over the past year due to the pandemic or to the thousands of caregivers who continue to provide care while grieving uh, for individuals who they came to know and love. Many others have experienced uncertainty and fear as loved ones have suffered from the effects of COVID or from loneliness as a result of public health measures that have meant visits have been uh, curtailed, in some cases limited to phone calls, video chats, or interaction through windows. Our heart goes out to all of those who have been affected in this way. But there is good news. Just as this is a bright, sunny, uh, spring-feeling day in Alberta with the Chinook here in Calgary, there is hope. As more and more seniors get COVID-19 vaccines and severe outcomes are in decline, families and facilities like Aged Care Seton are beginning to experience relief. Our hope grows with every vaccine shipment and every shot in the arm. Every sunny day like this that leads to more outdoor visits and every day we can appreciate those Albertans who have given up so much to our province's health in the past year. That's why Budget 2021 has earmarked more than $3.5 billion in the health budget for services and supports to help aging and vulnerable Albertans get the services and care they need in the communities and places they call home, places like Age Care Seton. This $3.5 billion combined in community, continuing and home care programs is an increase of more than $200 million or 6% over last year. In addition, 
Our three-year capital plan, that's the money that we invest in infrastructure, um, in buildings, roads, and, and, and the like. Well, that we have in that, we have allocated over half a billion dollars to upgrade existing and to create new continuing care capacity in Alberta for seniors over the next three years. That's an historic investment in building new facilities like this and um, helping to modernize some of the older continuing care and, uh, and other seniors congregate facilities. This includes over $150 million over three years to upgrade and create new continuing care spaces in priority communities that where the need is greatest, where there are the longest wait lists, for example. Minister Shandra will provide more details about this in a second, uh, but uh, let me say that this funding, the funding we are discussing today, with it the government is continuing to work to improve seniors uh, and supports for seniors and other vulnerable Albertans. This includes a review of facility-based continuing care that will provide recommendations on workforce, funding, oversight and accountability. On top of that, uh, we are pursuing streamlined legisla a le legislative framework that will be developed for the continuing care system because right now there's uh, multiple different laws that touch on the continuing care system, making it difficult for operators uh, to interpret all of that. We're going to simplify it uh, and so that uh, uh, there's a very clear legal framework for the operation of uh, nursing homes. And I'd like to thank MLA for Calgary Fish Creek Richard Gottfried for helping to lead that initiative. We anticipate new legislation uh, that he's working on being introduced later this year. And then uh, a Peace River member of, of the legislature, Dan Williams, has continued to lead consultations on palliative and end-of-life care, as we committed to in the last election, and how government should support Albertans in their final days as part of our palliative care strategy, adding resources uh, to provide for that kind of uh, compassionate care at life's end. Alberta's government will also be looking at a redesign of the home care system in order to make it more easily accessible for clients. This will include expanding access to client directed care options to provide more choice and control to clients. And that's really our central vision in the whole healthcare system is that it must be patient focused, not based on different interest groups or uh, demands, but rather it's got to always be about the patient and empowering uh, patients, in this case, those who rely on home care. So stay tuned for updates on these and other initiatives. Uh, let me close by saying that Alberta seniors deserve the very best care possible. I'm sure every Albertan is connected to someone who relies on facilities like Aged Care Seton to provide safety, comfort and care in their later years. Uh, and the COVID pandemic has uh, only served to remind us all of just how important these services are and how amazing the people who deliver them are as well. I, I've got to tell you, every time I visit a place like this, uh, when I get to meet the staff, uh, the, the joy that they bring to their workplace, the compassion uh, and the professionalism is inspiring. So this is all why we are making uh, historic investments in continuing care in Budget 2021, a plan to protect lives and livelihoods. It's to be there for them and to be there uh, for you. Protecting lives has been and will continue to be Alberta's priority uh, right through this pandemic and beyond. And with that, I will invite Minister Chandra to provide details on uh, the, uh, the budget investments uh, in continuing care. Well, thank you, Premier, and uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, also want to uh, thank Dr. Patel and Dr. Jivraj and uh, everyone at Aged Care for hosting us today. As Premier said, the, the joy and the professionalism that uh, staff and continuing care throughout the province bring to their jobs every day is, is always inspiring. It's always wonderful to, to meet those folks. I uh, also want to thank all the residents, as uh, Premier said, who are watching from their windows, and all the staff here at Seton for welcoming, uh, welcoming us into their community today. And it's a beautiful modern facility and South Health Campus is a great reminder of how the health system has expanded along with the growth of the City of Calgary. We're going to keep on investing to meet the needs 
of continuing care here in Calgary as well as across the province. Alberta seniors and people with disabilities deserve safe, they deserve quality care that allows them to age in the right place, in their homes, in their communities, with their friends and with their families. And the provincial government is committed to providing it through a model of care that meets four goals. The system needs to first continue to shift from hospital to community-based home and hospice care. Uh, second, to develop effective caregiver supports to better support Albertans in their homes and in their communities. And the third, to help clients stay in their homes longer through more client-directed funding options. And as well, the fourth one, to support upgrading existing facilities and to develop new spaces through partnerships between government and operators. And as Premier noted, the government has allocated a combined $3.5 billion for community, continuing care and home care programs in Budget 21, an increase of $200 million, or 6%, over the last year. Now, this uh, funding breaks down as follows. $736 million for home care, $1.6 billion for designated supportive living and $1.2 billion for long-term care. And now Alberta's government understands the importance of developing, the importance of maintaining continuing care facilities for our aging and vulnerable populations throughout the province. Additional funding from the $1.25 billion for COVID contingency will also be used to help the continuing care system to address the challenges of the pandemic. COVID has taken too high of a toll on seniors. We need to acknowledge the families who have lost loved ones and honor them by resolving to make the continuing care system here in Alberta a better one and a safer one. And we need to press ahead with protecting seniors based on the evidence that shows that they continue to be at the highest risk of severe illness and the highest risk of death. And I'm proud that we were the first province to complete second doses for all residents of publicly funded continuing care facilities. We're making great progress with the current group of seniors who are 75 and over. And I'm looking forward to opening up eligibility to phase two within a few weeks, starting with uh, those who are between the ages of 65 and, and 74. All healthcare is deeply personal, but continuing care is most of all, because it's about our parents, it's about our grandparents, and each of us owes a debt of gratitude to them personally, and we honor them as a community by making sure that they are treated with dignity and that they're treated with respect. And that very much goes for me personally. My, my Baba, before she passed, was in continuing care, and I think of her uh, every time that I think about our continuing care system and the, the great improvements that we need to work as a province to, to working to improving the continuing care system for these residents. And I think uh, every Albertan deserves the same standard of care that uh, folks like my Baba received. And that's the promise our health system uh, provides and it's the, my commitment as Minister. Alberta's government is ensuring that the continuing care system has the resources that it needs to protect residents, to protect staff, now and after we've seen the end of the pandemic. And as part of that commitment, our capital plan for Budget 21 includes over a half billion dollars for continuing care in the next three years. And that funding includes $115 million over three years to complete the Bridgeland Riverside Continuing Care Center here in Calgary, which I visited recently with my colleague, Minister Ponda. $246 million over three years to finish building the Gene Zwazdeski Center at Norwood in Edmonton. $154 million as well to upgrade or develop new long-term care and designated supportive living spaces across the province. We're targeting this funding to priority communities, including Indigenous communities. The $154 million that I mentioned will be available through capital grant programs that will be launched later this year. And as Minister of Health, I'm proud to say that we have a budget that reflects a record level of investment, one that will strengthen our health system now and, and into the future. 
This funding will help to address the needs of seniors and those with disabilities. We'll continue to work to make our health system here in Alberta more responsive to the individual needs that uh, patients have, that residents have, and their preferences, and to be more efficient, to be more effective, so that we achieve better outcomes for Albertans now and in, into the future. As Premier said, to make the health system centered on patients, not institutions, and not on special interests. So thank you very much, and now I'll turn it over to Salima Walji Shivji, who is, uh, as Premier said, the, the board chair of the Alberta Continuing Care Association. Very proud to be working with her uh, and, and her members. And so after Salima, we'll hear from Leela Schelt, who is the executive director of the Christian Health Association of Alberta. Good morning. My name is Salima Walji Shivji, and I'm honored to serve as the board chair for the Continuing Care Association. On behalf of the ACCA, I would like to thank Premier Kenny and Minister Shandro for including the ACCA in today's announcement. The ACCA represents public, private, faith-based and not-for-profit operators providing care and services to seniors, including home care, supported living and long-term care. Our members operate more than half of the designated supported living and long-term care beds in Alberta. We would like to thank the government for recognizing continuing care in budget 2021 with an increase to funding for all streams of continuing care, as well as capital funding to support both continuing care spaces that are new in priority communities and the upgrading of existing facilities. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of addressing aging continuing care infrastructure. Our membership is pleased with this investment. This funding is urgently needed with the number of seniors in the province set to more than double over the next 15 years. During COVID, the ACCA has worked closely with the government and Alberta Health Services to ensure that we bring the perspective of operators to the table in all decision making. I would like to thank the Premier and the Minister for including the ACCA membership in weekly and sometimes daily meetings to ensure that decisions and resource allocation are practical when they hit the ground for our staff and residents. Thank you to the Premier and Minister Shandro for providing much needed financial support to our members. The ACCA would also like to extend a sincere thank you to Dr. Hinshaw for her steady and ongoing leadership. The government's investment in continuing care will help us to ensure that we continue to offer the very best care possible to our residents across the province. Thank you. Thank you, Salima. I'm Leah Lachelt speaking on behalf of the Christian Health Association of Alberta. I'd like to express our gratitude to the Premier and Minister Shandro for today's announcement and acknowledge the tremendous partnership between the government and CHA operators in maintaining a high functioning continuing care system. Members of CHEA are all not-for-profit operators that have served Albertans in every corner of this province for more than 150 years. We were Alberta's first healthcare system back in the 1800s and we continue to play a vital role today within our publicly funded system. Our operators support 14,000 residents and seniors through community outreach programs, subsidized housing, supportive living, long-term care, and palliative care services. 
95% of today's seniors are able to live independently and safely on their own with the help of community and health services. And about 5% need the additional support that is offered in our continuing care facilities. Since the pandemic began one year ago, CHA operators have worked as partners with government and Alberta Health Services to protect the hundreds and thousands of seniors and other vulnerable Albertans who count on us. Our COVID-19 journey together started with a commitment to ensure our operators had the masks, gowns and face shields we needed to protect our residents and employees. We worked with government to ensure staff chose just one place of employment to prevent the spread of infection between sites. By joining forces with our employees, our unions, and most importantly with our residents and families, we were able to ensure a safe and stable care team in all of our sites. We also collaborated on a significant funding program to boost staffing levels across our sites. And later, we worked together to ensure families could continue visiting their loved ones while minimizing the risk of bringing COVID infection into our facilities. And now we're working as partners to roll out COVID vaccines as quickly as possible to our residents and staff. Going forward, we know the future of continuing care in Alberta has changed forever. We'll need to keep working together to ensure we have the right number of spaces to meet the needs of those who will need care in the years to come. Our aging facilities will need to be upgraded to meet the new standards in infection control. Our staff will need ongoing learning and development regarding our new normal. We'll need to drive innovation and research into new models of care and new kinds of community partnerships. And for the vast majority of seniors that will want to remain in their own homes, we'll need to support them and their family caregivers every step of the way through outreach programs, new technologies, and flexible models to deliver support services. CHA is deeply privileged to walk alongside our residents, our families, our staff, our communities and government as we grow into the future together. We are truly looking forward to the next 150 years. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now go to the phones for questions. We'll do one question, one follow-up today. And with that, operator, can you please put through our first caller? Fletcher Kent, Global News. Thank you so much. My question is for the Premier. Thanks for taking it. Uh, a number of your MLAs have posted uh, some, have made some posts about questioning the wisdom of some of the province's uh, COVID restrictions. A growing number of them now have, saying that they're disappointed, and they're also saying that they're disappointed that they first heard of these changes to the restrictions on Facebook Lives. How concerned are you with the increasing number of MLAs that are publicly disagreeing with you, and uh, what do, you, do you fear that this uh, hurts your ability to lead? I'm not at all surprised that Albertans have a range of opinions on the right response to COVID. That's been the case from the day, uh, from day one. Uh, and uh, there's been a lively debate, uh, just as we have around the COVID, cab COVID cabinet committee table and around the government caucus. Uh, it's an ongoing debate on exa what ex is the best uh, response to control the virus so that it uh, doesn't threaten and overwhelm our health care system so that we can avoid large-scale preventable deaths and at the same time minimize the negative effect on our broader society that comes from many restrictions. So um, I welcome input from uh, MLAs of, of both parties uh, and uh, there's quite a, quite a diversity of views there. At the end of the day, uh, the government is responsible for uh, taking the expert public health advice of the chief medical officer and her team, closely studying the data uh, and uh, making difficult decisions. None of them are easy. Um, it's, it's no secret that uh, I don't like any of these restrictions. Uh, it's no secret that this government has looked at restrictions as a last and limited resort, not as a first and maximum policy. Um, I think generally, I, I, well, we'll, 
anybody can criticize aspects of our policy. I think generally Albertans have done very well uh, through the pandemic. Um, for the first, uh, from March until November of last year, uh, we had a, a, a better record in terms of COVID than the lar most of the large Canadian provinces, U.S. states and European countries. Uh, with uh, lighter restrictions. We had a very unfortunate spike in cases in the fall, uh, but we continue to be well below the national average in terms of per capita fatalities. Uh, and uh, thanks, to the, uh, thanks, thanks to the diligence of Albertans in the past three months, we've really managed to bend the curve down. As you know, the concern now is that we have seen uh, uh, an uptick in new cases, in active cases, in the rate of transmission, and a, a small increase in the number of more infectious new variant cases. And the, the government cannot wish those things away. Uh, we can't let uh, politics get in the way of a responsible public health response. As we've always said, we, we are seeking in so doing to balance lives and livelihoods. So uh, we welcome a, a constructive criticism about the, the, the best path forward. I, I would say to uh, individuals who uh, believe that, that restrictions are too stringent, that uh, in fact uh, over 99% of Alberta businesses are able to operate within public health measures. Um, we have never had the, ki the kind of uh, real lockdown that we've seen in most other parts of the Western world. Um, most Canadian school children cannot go to their classrooms right now because their schools are shut. Uh, most, uh, can, most Canadians live in jurisdictions right now, parts of Ontario, Quebec, for example, where uh, they have stay-at-home orders. And in many millions of Canadians live under curfews. Uh, most Canadians live in areas where they cannot engage in congregational worship to practice freedom of religion. None of those things are true of Alberta. None of them have been true of Alberta, except for uh, it, when we had to face the, the real threat uh, of the, in the spring. Uh, but uh, our schools have been open um, since uh, August, with the exception of one week over Christmas. Um, our places of worship have been open within public health guidelines since last May. Uh, and uh, we've had the most open uh, approach towards uh, business operations as well. So I, I think uh, while, while people can criticize uh, various aspects of it, we certainly get a lot of criticism from the other side, and that debate is totally legitimate. Uh, I, I would say Alberta's done a good job of, of balancing the different and uh, very serious issues here. One quick follow-up uh, for either the uh, Premier or the Health Minister, whoever uh, feels best to answer it. Uh, just a question about the AstraZeneca vaccine. I understand it is arriving in the country right now. Alberta is following a number of the recommendations right now not to give it to the seniors 65 and over. There, is there any more progress on decisions being made about who, who is going to get those uh, vaccines and the timelines for that rollout? Well, I believe Minister and or Dr. Hinshaw will be addressing that this afternoon, correct? Yeah, so just stay tuned. There's another news conference this afternoon at 3.30, I believe, uh, where that will be addressed. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Bill Fortier, CTV News. Uh, good morning. I do have a question and a quick follow-up, uh, either for the Premier or Health Minister, I guess, whoever would like to address it. Uh, speaking of vaccines, just looking for a little clarification here on uh, timeline. Uh, the federal government has been saying for months now uh, – by the end of September, every Canadian who wants one will have one. Uh, Alberta is saying that, you know, the phase that involves the general public doesn't start until uh, until September, until the fall. So which is right and why the discrepancy? And a follow-up after that. Well, this is, look, we are uh, basing our planning on... Uh, the re reality that the federal government has not kept its commitments to date. They have missed every single timeline by for d delivery of doses by an order of magnitude. Um, what, all I can tell you is that Alberta Health Services is uh, ready and, to, and able to inoculate uh, hundreds of thousands of Albertans per week if and when we get critical supply. This is not a provincial problem. It's not a provincial issue. Uh, the government of Canada was responsible for vaccine procurement. They have put us in a position where we are 44th in the world in terms of 
access to the vaccine on a per capita basis. Canada, under Mr. Trudeau's leadership, is behind many third world developing countries in accessing the vaccines. And uh, so um, promises that all of that's going to change are the same promises we've been hearing now for over two months. And you'll pardon me if I'm a little bit upset about this, because every day that we don't get those promised doses is another day when vulnerable Albertans are at risk. It's another day where we have to maintain public health restrictions that have other damaging effects. So, and right now we are caught in a race between vaccines and variants. Uh, we need those vaccines. And I, I, whatever the projections are, look, we, we've come to, to learn that we cannot count on the federal timelines. They have not met a single timeline. And, and quite frankly, the, I, I don't understand why the national media isn't holding this government more to account for this total failure. Israel is approaching, I think, 85% of their population inoculated. Britain approaching or over a third of their population inoculated. The Americans, I think it's over, they're approaching 20% inoculated. We're at 4% in Canada. So when we get everyone inoculated depends on one thing, which is when the federal government does its job and gets us the doses. Uh, Tyler, would you like to add to that? So I, 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 in terms of discrepancy, again, the discrepancy is between their uh, committed uh, uh, arrival schedule, supply schedule, and what's actually been happening. Um, we were supposed to get uh, significant, hundreds of thousands more doses by now than we have received. But all I can tell you is we're ready to roll as quickly as we can uh, through much of between, between basically Christmas and, uh, and um, through, through February, we, uh, we had uh, one of the highest levels per capita inoculation in the country. We hope to maintain that uh, pace. Okay, thanks. Quick follow-up. Uh... Sorry, one second. Sorry, before your follow-up. Um, I, I think you're right to point out that there's a discrepancy between what the Prime Minister has said and what we're saying. And the reason for that discrepancy is that there's, there's a difference between what he says publicly and the allotment tables that we get from Health Canada. And uh, it's a spreadsheet, um, and in each cell of those spreadsheets, there's a, for each of those columns, it's a different week from, from March until April, May, June, and onwards. And April, blank. Each of those cells are blank. Uh, May, blank. June, blank. Um, I think there's still blank cells in the columns for, for March still left to be filled out. Um, on top of that, when they were filled out for February, in, when we were originally given these allotment tables, the rug was pulled out from under us in, in February, and we got nowhere near what the, we were told we were going to be expecting. Now, I'm happy that we're, we're now starting to get more stable supply of Pfizer vaccines for, for March. But that still doesn't give us any certainty of what we're going to get in April. We are, are making, um, our, what we're telling the public is based on what information we can get from Health Canada and what we can get from the federal government. And we will have to continue to rely on, on what we're getting, not on the, the public comments of the Prime Minister at, uh, at a podium. Thank you. There's a, a follow-up question then for me or for Premier. Uh, you know what, it's probably for either of you. Um, uh, first of all, though, if you talked about these tables with, that show these blanks. Uh, we would love to see that if, uh, if Steve Buick or someone else was around who could send those out to us. We'd love to be able to see those tables that show uh, a lack of vaccines uh, coming. But the, the second question, uh, or the follow-up, is today the, the Prime Minister said, uh, like the U.S. did yesterday, he expects that can, he's optimistic that Canada's timelines could actually move up as more vaccines are being um, approved by Health Canada and the deliveries are accelerating uh, to Canada. I'm just wondering, uh, to the Health Minister, if you share that optimism that perhaps the timelines that exist now, whether whichever one is correct, whether it's the provinces or the federal governments, you know, could that potentially be sped up? Potentially. Um, look, we have two vaccines that are being delivered right now to Alberta, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, we have three vaccines that have been approved by Health Canada. Um, I think we've made it very clear throughout the pandemic that the resources to Health Canada 
um, have, um, have not been sufficient throughout the pandemic for them to go through their approval processes for either uh, different types of tests, different types of uh, vaccines, different types of uh, other uh, tools for us to be able to respond to the pandemic. They haven't had the resources. We see Canada lagging behind the approval processes of other jurisdictions. So if we have more vaccines, I, I suppose. Um, but we haven't seen that happen yet. And we can only make commitments based on the, uh, the allotment tables and the shipments of, of vaccines that we've received so far. Sorry? We, and we will, we'll, that's a great question. We will uh, share those allotment tables. Thank you. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Fran Thompson, iPolitics. Uh, questions for the Premier. A few weeks ago, Premier, you mentioned that uh, some internal government polling of the public indicated that about 40% of Albertans uh, support the current measures, about 40% want tougher measures, and 20% want uh, a, a, uh, the measures to be relaxed, fewer measures. Is that still the case? Are you following people's preferences? And also, it seems that, um, that you're often focused on that 20%. Uh, to explain to them why are you so focused when it seems the majority of Albertans appreciate the fact that you have to bring in strong measures? Well, uh, Graham, as Dr. Hinshaw has always pointed out, the what matters most is not the stringency of restrictions, but compliance with them. And if you have a large segment of the population that is uh, doesn't accept the need uh, for uh, careful uh, public health measures and just reject them, uh, if you have a large segment of the population that, that just uh, go back to at-home socializing and, and higher-risk activities, uh, then you have a public health problem. So it's very important. Uh, and, and this is, I'll be very transparent with you, one of the most challenging aspects of the decision-making of our cabinet, cabinet uh, COVID committee is um, understanding how to bring the public along with us on difficult restrictions that, that that can really disrupt people's lives and cause real uh, adversity. It, there's no easy answer to that question, but we have to keep, constantly keep an, our, uh, keep an eye on uh, the, the willingness of the broad Alberta public to do the right thing through the pandemic. And um, if you end up with just a, like I say, a large segment of the population that says they've given up then you've got a public health problem as well. So that's why um, I'm uh, constantly trying to make the case to people who uh, don't like public health measures or restrictions, but why they are necessary. Um, you, you know, there, there are some, there's a small fraction of people. Uh, you see them doing protests in Calgary, in Calgary and Edmonton who are pretty much in complete denial about the reality and the threat of the pandemic. But I, I think the, the larger share of those people who are opposed to restrictions uh, are more fo just more focused on the negative consequences of those restrictions for people's uh, mental health, for example. Um, and we shouldn't diminish that. We need to listen to those voices. Uh, we, we need to include them in our decision making. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do in a balanced way. I, I won't pretend it's easy, but it, it's necessary. And just to follow up, uh, thank you for that. Um, is that number still the same? Is it still 40, 40, 20? Is that number sort of staying right. firm as the people who are opposed or, or support your restrictions, or is that changing? I think that's that's fairly uh, constant. It's, it's it's fairly constant. It, we, we've sometimes seen um, small variations in those numbers, but that's pretty much the public opinion environment that we've seen uh, for several months here. We have time for two more questions. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Janet French, CBC. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, so we've heard from from some people, some critics of the system, that you know one of the real vulnerabilities we saw during the pandemic, during the continuing in the continuing care system, was the way that both public and private facilities are staffed by low-paid workers, often with part-time or casual work, working two or three jobs, moving between these facilities, just trying to earn enough to live. So when you say that the workforce aspect of the system is going to be reviewed, can you be more specific? What consultations with workers does this include?
Uh, great question, Janet. And um, so there's actually two different types of, of review that are happening right now. And we started with a review of the legislation. It's uh, we, we have three different pieces of legislation, I think at least three different um, regs as well that, that govern the whole spectrum of continuing care. And so we started off with a review of the legislation and then we proceeded with uh, a review of facility-based continuing care and the funding models that we provide to our operators. Um, right now the, the uh, panel includes not just uh, my, my colleague, as uh, Premier mentioned, uh, Richard Godfrey, the MLA for Calgary Fish Creek, but also a wide range of folks. There are uh, family members of residents, there is a resident as well of continuing care, there are operators, there is uh, HSs involved and uh, they are consulting with um, workers as well as operators in both um, the, 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 the publicly delivered, the, the HS and, and covenant uh, facilities as well as the, the independent uh, providers in the system and so they're, they're finishing up the, that review in, in the coming months so that we can work towards a new continuing care act uh, this fall that I, I'm hopeful to, to be able to table and, and present to the legislature as well as uh, an opportunity for us to present new opportunities for, for the funding of our operators throughout the province. Thanks, Janet. Janet, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of like what is the real goal of your review? Like how do you want continuing care, aging in place, long-term care to look different as a result of this. And just tossing in a bonus follow-up, follow-up, are you still planning on proceeding with the privatization of Care West and Capital Care as uh, recommended in the EY report? Sure, I'll, I'll answer in, in reverse order. So uh, we, we've, um, as a, a cabinet, um, directed AHS to proceed at this time with only a portion, a balanced portion, responsible portion, especially um, in considering the pandemic that we're responding to right now of the AHS review. Now, if AHS wanted to come back to us with uh, implementing any further measures, that would be up to AHS to come back to us when they feel that they could uh, proceed with any of the implementation plan. I can't speak on, on whether and, and if Cabinet would uh, direct AHS to proceed with that one recommendation. Um, we have so far only directed AHS to proceed with that balanced uh, portion. Um, the, the, you asked first, though, uh, about what is the goal of all of this. Uh, I can give you a couple examples, but we really are trying to make the continuing care system, and that does, uh, it's a spectrum. It's, it goes from one end, long-term care, the, the most intensive types of care that we provide residents, to home care on the, the other end of the spectrum. And, and when it comes to long-term care, when it comes to DSL, DSL is the supportive living that is publicly funded as opposed to the what we call licensed supportive living, uh, which is the, uh, the non-publicly funded uh, supportive living. Um, there are opportunities for us to make the system um, more focused on patients, centered around patients rather than the institutions. And one example is when, instead of allowing someone to age in place, if somebody needs a more intensive level of care, they have to leave their home and then they have to go back into a pathway to find a new place for them to live. We need our residents to be able to age in place. We need operators to be able to provide a, a wide range of the different types of levels of care that are needed rather than having pathways for patients that are centered around the institutions and not around those patients. Another example is why we can't have spouses living together if they need different levels of care and it's, it's, um, it's something that's a big concern of mine. Um, and it's one of the, the issues that um, um, started us down the path of reviewing the, the different types of legislation and the funding models for these operators. So just two examples as a, to, to provide you, Janet. So thank you for those uh, thoughtful questions. Operator, can you please put through our last caller? Charlotte Demulin, Radio Canada. <laughs> Maybe worse than the French. Hello? Oui? Allô, est-ce que c'est moi qui ai la ligne? Oui, oui. Allez, allez. Vous m'entendez bien? Parfait. Parfait. Alors, euh, ma question, c'est, euh, vous me suis tenu, vous dites que vous êtes peut-être ouvert à prolonger, euh, comme la Colombie-Britannique, la période entre l'administration des deux doses des vaccins. Donc, quel impact ça aurait sur la vaccination en Alberta? Et c'est quand vous pensez que tout le monde pourrait avoir oui. reçu la première dose? 
Alors, il y aura une annonce prochainement à cet égard. Euh, moi, j'étais toujours de l'opinion qu'il faut vacciner autant que personne que possible, si vite que possible, parce que c'est clair de recherche de l'Israël, du Québec, du Royaume-Uni, que euh, cette euh, plus protective d'inoculer euh, les gens euh, avec la première dose du vaccin, euh, mais même s'il si, euh, faut avoir une période euh, plus longue avant la, deuxième, euh, avant, avant la deuxième dose. Mais euh, comme un gouvernement, on a attendu euh, euh, l'avis, euh, le conseil du, euh, des experts scientifiques. Évidemment, il y a un comité avisoire au, euh, au fédéral et nous avons notre propre comité scientifique pour la pandémie en Alberta. On a attendu euh, le... le, le les conclusions de leurs études de cette question euh, de, de période entre les deux doses, par exemple de Pfizer, et euh, nous, nous, nous annoncerons une décision très prochainement à cet égard. The, uh, uh, first, uh, sometimes I get people on Facebook complaining that they don't understand the French, so the question was, I'll just do an English uh, summary, the question was about um, essentially the BC decision to prolong first and second doses of the Pfizer vaccine by 92 days. And my response was, my personal opinion has always been that it is more effective to get as many people as vaccinated as quickly as possible, uh, even if that means having to delay the second dose. We've seen very encouraging uh, research and experience in that that validates that view coming out of Israel, the United Kingdom and Quebec that did uh, prolong the interval between the two vaccines. Um, uh, between the two doses, uh, but we were waiting as a government to receive the scientific advice of both the national and provincial uh, scientific advisory committees, uh, and we'll be making an announcement about our approach in the very near future. Okay, thanks very much, everyone.